All right. Welcome, friends. Um, can everybody hear me? All right. So, I um, uh, hope you're having a great DrupalCon last day. Hope you had a good lunch. Uh, I skipped mine. Your food makes me lazy. Um, so, yeah, uh, I'm sure, you know, a few of you would also be feeling a little uh, easy. So let's do a little warm-up exercise. Show of hands, might work here, right? Let's try to understand, you know, do a little bit of a profiling, see who we are, and uh, it'll give me, and you know, you uh, an idea of who is present in the room. So, uh, a show of hands, please, for uh, all those who are coding, developers, programmers, engineers. All right. And what about uh, managers? All right, that's awesome. More managers than engineers. Excellent, always the case. Uh, uh, and uh, what about Agil? Uh, you know, all of those who have been doing Agil or you know know well about Agil. Okay, good few. So, uh, and how many of you know uh, or have heard about no hashtag no estimates? Ah, okay, cool. How many know me? <laughs> okay, great. Thanks. So for all the others, uh, my name is uh, Piyush Podar. I come all the way from India. I'm, I'm working with Accelerant as uh, Director of Professional Services. Uh, in my past, I've been, uh, you know, everything related to a typical project SDLC, uh, both, you know, development sales, developer, architect, manager, biz dev, account exec, account manager, you know, so on and so forth, since 1997, so it's almost, I would say, 19 years now. Uh, and I've been associated with Drupal since last eight years. And I live in India in a beautiful city called Jaipur, uh, a, a city of forts and palaces, uh, you know, forts that never saw any war. So let's jump straight through estimations. We'll, we'll start with estimations and then we'll uh, we'll see what, what are the challenges you know, we all are facing and then we'll see what no estimates is all about, what's the philosophy, how can we use it, uh, and uh, uh, then we'll see some use cases. Uh, and few people behind this uh, no estimates who, who've advocated what, uh, what these approaches are. Uh, it's an interesting thing actually, you know, it started with a Twitter uh, hashtag based uh, tweet by someone a few years ago, uh, which led to some conversations, led to you know, more uh, research and interest, people, uh, blogging posts, uh, posting blog posts, videos, uh, lots of presentations at conferences and all. And now a lot of companies, uh, organizations, and individuals are using this uh, going forward uh, to ease some of the pains that are associated with estimations and such. So we will see how uh, 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 as we progress to that. So before we go there, uh, you know, let's understand what estimates are, what estimations are, and uh, why don't, you know, uh, why don't you tell me what, what do you think are estimations? What, what do you think are you know estimations? Why why do you do it? Uh, how do you use estimations? And uh, uh, yeah, I mean anyone you know you can just sit there and speak loudly. Because clients need them. Clients need them. Excellent, <laughs> excellent. I don't need a show of hands to to see how many would agree to that. I believe a majority of us would. Any any other uh, answer to that? What? All right, so to, to, to plan the resources and, and project planning, okay. Anyone else? Please. Clients think they need them. Sorry? Clients think they need them. Clients think they need them, yeah, okay. Which, again, right, it's the same thing. Yes? If you're in-house, not an agency, your stakeholders need to know what's going on. Who wants to All right, so stakeholders are clients, you know, I believe they are the same clan. So uh, they need, someone else needs them, and that's, what, that's why we are asked to do that, right? All right, I think those are uh, very common, uh, common use cases which uh, majority of us, uh, you know, agree with or have been, uh, 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 I've seen that. So I did uh, a quick, uh, you know, Wikipedia search, Google search, and this is what I came across with. Uh, estimations are a rough calculation of the value, number, uh, quantity or extent of something, a judgment of the worth or character of someone or something. Uh, 
nowhere did I find any mention of the word called facts. Right. So, you know, we could safely conclude that estimations are guesses, not facts. Uh, unless, you know, otherwise they would have been called factimates, perhaps, not estimates, which they are not. Now, what is a good estimation? Well, that's a, that varies from, you know, individual to individual companies, organizations. Uh, but uh, a good few years back, you know, a few people uh, uh, decided their estimations, and this was fairly uh, uh, relevant as well. By definition, a good estimate is within 25% of the actual result, 75% of the time. So which means uh, if you are, you've, you've done an estimation of a project for 400 days, if you are able to deliver that within maybe 300 to 500, you're good enough. If out of four such instances, you are able to deliver three, good enough, not bad. Let us look at some industry statistics. Uh, uh, I'm, uh, I'm sure you have heard about Chaos Report. Uh, Chaos Report is a industry uh, report uh, uh, done by, shared by uh, Standish Group. They do it every year. They uh, take data from around 50,000 plus projects across various sizes including uh, uh, you know, minor enhancements to mammoth enterprise applications and implementations. Um, and they do this for every year. I believe they have been doing this for at least a good 15 years now, which, which gives us a, a good benchmark and baseline to compare how industry is you know, uh, performing in terms of these uh, software IT projects success. And uh, these are some of the numbers. Uh, we could focus on 2015. I'm, uh, I'm, I don't think you'll be able to see the green ones. So that's uh, uh, that's successful. The second one, the second column, uh, actually the third column, yellow, is challenged, and third is failures. And as you can see, 19% of uh, have been absolute failures, which means uh, these are projects that have been cancelled prior to completion or delivered, on and then never used. 52% or close to that have been challenged meaning they have been delivered, but you know, delivered less features and functions that specified uh, specifications within uh, both time and cost, with to both time and cost overruns. And close to 29% have been successful, which means we are looking at only one third of success here. This is industry data. Uh, furthermore, the, the unsuccessful projects that we see here took around 200 plus, it's actually 220, 222%. Uh, longer than planned to complete time, 189% more cost than was budgeted, and delivered only 61% of the features and functions specified. So that's uh, not more than two-thirds of what was expected based on uh, you know, pre-planning and all that stuff. Uh, another, another data point uh, from Gartner. Uh, you know, I've, I've been attending DrupalCons and hearing a lot, of, a lot about Gartner data, so I thought maybe, you know, I'll take my chance as well. So uh, this is a, lit a little old data from 2012. Uh, it, it says small, mid to large size project failures have been close to 20%, 28, between 28% again, one third. Uh, McKenzie average cost overrun 66%, average time overruns have been in the lines likes of 44%, and average benefits shortfall, which is you know they have not been able to deliver the benefits expected, uh, close to 17%. So. Question comes, are, are estimates reliable? Uh, this is an interesting graph bit, uh, ex adopted from Steve McConnell's book, Software Estimation, Demystifying the Black Art. I'm sure a lot of you would have uh, read it, uh, if not at least heard about it. Uh, this, uh, this shows uh, uh, some plotting of uh, project estimates versus actuals in days, track record for one organization. I'll have to step down because I can't see that. So, uh, as you can see, uh, the, uh, the x-axis is estimated days to completion, and the y-axis is actual days of completion. And uh, you can look at some of the data, which is interesting. Uh, by the way, this, this diagonal line is the average, the, the perfect accuracy. So anything falling below this is a highly profitable project. Anything falling uh, uh, above this is not so. You see this number here? It seems this, uh, this was uh, estimated to be around, I don't know, 12 days. <laughs> Took around 
225 days. That's interesting. Uh, there's another one here. Close to 100 days were expected. Delivered 150, not so bad. Uh, look at this one, 200 days, 250, yeah, not so bad. But again, if you overall look at these stars, these projects, these have been those two-third of failure projects, I believe, that we've been talking about in those data points. So uh, uh, this, this, is a, this is a chart that has been you know, uh, popularly used in lots of presentations on project management and software failures, and examining how and what, what to do about that. Okay, um, I'll try to pronounce that. Hofstad, Hofstadter's law. So it always takes longer than you expect, even when you take into account this law. <laughs> so Douglas, uh, you know, observed uh, when, it, when, when he was working on a, uh, the project, you know, which uh, I don't remember the name of the project, but that's what the, uh, the project for uh, playing against chess, chess grandmasters. He, he observed that uh, no matter how much work went into developing computer programs to play chess against grandmasters, the winning program always seems to be 10 years away. Another one, uh, this is very relevant to uh, software industry, something that we come across every day without realizing. Parkinson's law, work expands so as to fill the time available for its completion. Um, uh, there's a guy called Dhawal Panchal. I, I, I uh, stole his uh, diagram here, which, which was very interesting. This is about uh, depicting what you don't know, you don't know. You know, this, this relates to why we estimate, uh, this relates to how we estimate and, you know, where do we actually uh, stumble. So, uh, the small yellow circle you see is uh, things we know that we know. The bigger circle, the bigger uh, uh, the larger yellow circle you see are these are the things that we know that we don't know. And then there are things that we don't know that we don't know. I, I did a Google, Google uh, search on this thing and I also came across uh, a famous uh, uh, saying by uh, uh, Donald Rumsfeld uh, where he said, I had a video, I wanted to play, play that but it, it, it spoke about terrorist you know, activities and Iraq and all that stuff so I avoided. Uh, sorry. Uh, he said, there are known unknowns, uh, these are things we know that we know, there are known unknowns, Th that is to say, there are things that we know we don't know, but there are also unknown unknowns, these are things we don't know, we don't know. He was talking about, you know, uh, the, uh, uh, the issue around weapons of mass destruction and Iraq war and all that stuff, somewhere in 20, uh, 2002, a lot back. So, uh, the reason why I'm showing this, this diagram here, this, this chart here, is uh, to take your attention to the big, large red circle which often gets neglected when we try to do estimations, right? We, we often pad uh, and add buffers to our estimates for things that we know that we don't know now, but what about all those things which we act, uh, you know, just don't know at all? They may happen, they may not happen, and if they happen, they'll screw up the whole uh, planning process there. So. Uh, Trying to explain this in a little more uh, technical way, uh, there are two things which uh, basically define the cost of a feature, uh, 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 essential complication and accidental complication. Uh, this, is, uh, this was explained by J.B. Rainsberger. There's a, there's a nice video on Vimeo uh, that you can see, go and watch. I can share the links later. Uh, so essential complications are apparent complications. These are things we know uh, are there with the project, you know, complexity, technical challenges, et cetera, et cetera, that we are aware of, uh, how hard a problem is uh, on its own. But then there's also called accidental complications. These are complications that creep in because we suck at our jobs, because of, you know, uh, un inefficient organizational structures or, or blockers because of those structures, because how we code, et cetera, you know, so many other, other, other things which are not really related to the problem, the, the, uh, the requirement, the, the project itself. And uh, a, a cost of a feature is often calculated based on these two parameters. So while doing an estimation, you, you have to be relative, you, you, you do relative estimation, right? So based on your past experience, you know, if something was X, you imagine that 
if we have similar size of accidental complication and essential complication, it would be 2x or 5x. That never helps. That never happens in real life, right? Uh, when was the last time that uh, cost of accidental complication was nearly zero or exact multiple of an essential complication, which is, you know, the x there? So cost of feature and functionality is driven by both of these. Um, oftentimes cost of accidental complication uh, supersedes way beyond uh, much more than the essential complication component. And that's where the relative uh, uh, analogy, analogy based estimations fail and are not accurate. And later, you know, uh, we realize that we've gone overboard by, you know, un un uh, 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 unnecessary numbers. So, um, Woody Zuil is 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 uh, a thinker and agile uh, advocate, and he's he's he was one of the guys who started talking about this uh, hashtag no estimates. I'll uh, quickly br uh, take you through a brief profile of some of these thinkers later, but uh, one of his uh, thoughts about what estimations are these, he believes that estimations are useless because they are guess based. What we think we know about the unknown. They are wasteful about the work that's not going to be used or the other way. They are harmful because they lead to decisions based on incorrect data, which subsequently leads to uh, consequences later. They are easily gamed. Estimations are easily gamed. I know I'm sure everybody would have done that or at least come across such instances. I did that as well, you know, a good few years ago. Uh, reminds me of, a, of an instance when I was a manager. I, I would often ask my team uh, to do estimates and then uh, they'll give me some data. I would have a separate estimation sheet with extra 20% padded there, which these guys won't know. Uh, but subsequently, they would start guessing that. They know that there was something extra being padded to these projects and, and they the later numbers, they automatically started padding those numbers as well. I still kept padding my 20% right. So we were looking at like failures. Uh, so you know you can easily game things. Again, uh, in planning poker as well, you might have uh, seen so, right? You, you know, breaking the user stories into a larger number of uh, pieces and incorrectly uh, guessing the numbers. You know, one person says five, another says three. You know, whoever is powerful is able to convince the other guy, of course, with some data and reasoning, but. You somehow you game those numbers. So uh, estimations are easily gamed. They are dysfunctional. This whole slide, this whole presentation is about it. And deceptive. That's I've added the last point for myself because they it, they, they they give you a, a wrong impression of what you're gonna do. Uh, this I won't go through each of these. This is just a table to show you. These are some of the estimation practices and uh, uh, frameworks that have been developed and evolved over years. Question is. Are we, are we trying to get better at estimations or, or, or what, right? The thing is we need to, we need to question our st status quo, right? We, we need to start doing something less, not, you know, keep, keep iterating over the same thing if it's not giving value and being more, more accurate. Or stop doing something and find ways to, to, uh, uh, to facilitate that, that process. Let's talk about no estimations. I, I believe I've uh, fairly uh, built a background now. Uh, no estimates uh, is, uh, is based on a couple of principles. Uh, the, the, the first one and most important is embrace agile principles. Second is focus on value. It's all about value and that's what the, the customer, the client wants in the end. Uh, deliver small slices of working software and it's, it's, it's very particular about you know, how and why should you slice and what advantage will we, will we get from that. Deliver early or frequently. Uh, some of the advocates even say, you know, deliver daily, right? So only do estimate, only have a story which is as small as what you can deliver tomorrow, but we'll see that. And customer collaboration. So uh, you need to have your customer collaborate with you on those things. It's so, so ne no estimation is not about uh, no estimations ever, by the way. It's not about not doing estimations. It's about uh, the minimum amount of estimates that is required to be done and then look carefully at ways to reduce that need even more. Um, so uh, I, I did mention Woody Zuil. Uh, there's another gentleman called Vasco Duarte uh, who was also one of the early uh, uh, agile advocates uh, of no estimates and 
uh, he had a, a approach that I personally like, so his approach is what I'm going to talk to you about, share, share this with you. Um, so he talks about, you know, focusing on throughput rather than story points, right? Uh, and this is a chart that uh, uh, was shared by Corey Foy on Twitter. Uh, this is uh, based on a team's data from few sprints uh, on a particular project. Uh, the bottom numbers you see are uh, the, the story point estimates and the left numbers, the, the y-axis you see are cycle times in days. So, so for those who don't know cycle time, cycle time uh, is the time spent working on an issue right from the start till the end. That's the cycle time. So uh, as you can see, uh, some of these uh, are big lines and some are small lines. These are the, uh, the story point estimates, right? Uh, uh, and you can see those, the story point estimates. This is not exactly Fibonacci series, I believe. There's one or two number different here, but close to that. So, so uh, and the length of the line, the height of the line is the time that, ac that actually took to complete a story of that particular size. So you can see how, how variable they are, how different they are. And uh, it's the, the chart is not very clear, but there are some small green triangles uh, right at the bottom of some of these, most of these lines. Those triangles are average numbers of the cycle times for those particular story points, uh, those particular user stories, right, of those sizes. So the point is, this, the actual cycle time is, differentials are huge, but the average is not so much. So it's better to base your predictions and forecasting on something which is not so variable as opposed to something which is, right, and we'll see how shortly. The, uh, so you know you can uh, you can do estimates in a couple of steps uh, using no estimates the first step is you absolutely have to have a stable team because what we are doing is we are trying to uh, trying to use uh, data from the past few sprints one or two uh, actually two or three sprints uh, and uh, ensure that you have reached a stable team a stable system state because then the data that you'll have will allow you to make some uh, some forecastings right and, and the way you do it is um, you take the, uh, the, so the size of these stories. I'll actually take you through that in, this, in, the, in the next one. Here, when I mention stable system, what's important is uh, to identify what, how would you uh, ensure that, a, how would you say that a system is stable uh, when the velocity of a system, uh, of a team or a project would be outside limit three times. So I'll, I'll show you a chart where you have to have a, average size of each story and then you have a high interval and low interval and as long as all of your stories are getting completed or sized within these two intervals and if you are having consecutive three more more than three stories uh, outside this limit your team is not stable your system is not stable so you have to plot those numbers on a chart based on data that you've seen from the past two or three sprints which will allow you to see if uh, if you have a stable system, if you have, then you've got the right data and based on those you can do some forecasting, you can plan things and, and go forward. Um, as well as if uh, the chart will show that if there are more than five points going in the same direction, uh, meaning you have a velocity, a lot of acceleration happening in terms of uh, uh, throughput, you have not reached a stable state. So stable, stable uh, system and team is very important here. Second step is you have to select the most important piece of work that you need to, to, to work on. You have to focus on value, right? Uh, and this is where, you know, uh, a lot of projects and a lot of deliveries fail because end of the day we realize that by the time we delivered something, 80% or 40% of those were not really useful, what was useful for something different. Uh, and for this you have to involve product owners uh, and a scrum team because the scrum team and the product owner, client stakeholders, they will together assess if this is X, X feature is more valuable than Y feature. Uh, this is very important. It should not just be driven by the client stakeholder. Uh, and value can be non-monetary. Non In fact, it, it has to be non-monetary. And uh, if you, all of you are aware of the, uh, the user story format, uh, as a user, you know, I want to do this so that X, Y, Z, that X, Y, Z is the value that we are expecting from user story. That's the value I'm talking about here. So, uh, so once you've done these things, uh, then you need to slice 
your 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 work uh, into smaller pieces, right? <laughs> All right. So uh, <laughs> you have to slice the. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Are you a client stakeholder? <laughs> All right. Thanks. Let's continue. So we need to slice features into user stories, and uh, so Vasco uh, suggests that you know the larger piece of work is a feature, and then you break it down to user stories, and then you break those user uh, user stories further down into what you can deliver. Uh, you have to uh, uh, you you can break them down into multiple user stories and generate options, and options will allow you to do those prioritizations, take some decisions. A larger user story may have lesser options, and thereby less flexibility of uh, you know being very flexible. Uh, and there's an invest principle, which I believe uh, agile uh, developers and managers and everybody are aware of. Uh, this is an invest with a slight twist. Uh, so uh, uh, this is about uh, identifying to what level or when a user story is ready to be used, uh, ready to be ex uh, processed. It has to be independent, vertically sliced instead of horizontally. Uh, when I say vertically sliced instead of horizontally, uh, I mean uh, do not slice the user stories into uh, architectural and uh, system levels, so saying one is database abstraction, another is you know maybe uh, APIs, third is something else. Rather, uh, slices in slide, slice the user stories into vertical slices, so that individual uh, stories are independent and they have all the components required and can be uh, uh, re, uh, you know uh, ignored as well if required if they have lesser value. Second, they should be negotiable, which is essence. They should have essence of value and not implementation, you know, the technical data, technical details. Third, they should be valuable, most important thing. Uh, they should generate value. Fourth is essential. So Agile, uh, Agile principles uh, advocate uh, estimable here, but no, estimation, uh, no estimate advocates say instead of estimable, it should be essential. Do not work on anything that's not essential at all. Fourth is small, you know, understood and small enough understood when I say you have understood that, yeah, what is required, what is to be done. And they should be text testable. So you know, the acceptable criteria uh, are what comes here. Um, you should do slicing along with the, with the, with the whole team, uh, full team. Then um, you, there shouldn't be any huge stories. Uh, you know, typically, uh, anything which is uh, greater than half a sprint is a very large story. Uh, they are not what you need to work on. You, you need to slice them further. These are just some interesting, you know, valuable rule of thumbs. You can revise and change these to what really works for you as well. Uh, uh, typically, uh, you can have six to twelve user stories uh, delivered in a say two weeks period. If if you follow a two week period sprint for your development, uh, five to one man day per user story is a good enough uh, uh, estimate. Not estimate uh, sizing. The, the, what's important to uh, ensure is that the statistical distribution of these user stories, you know, the large and the small ones uh, together, should be spread across the entire project. So it, it shouldn't be you are working on all the large, large user stories now and the smaller ones later. Uh, it will not allow you to do the forecasting which is required in case you need to answer a few questions for stakeholders and do some planning around that. And each of these user stories are actually going to be working software. So there should be testable, running tested stories. Meaning, once you develop, once you deliver these stories, uh, you have to uh, either uh, deploy them on a production or a production, uh, an, a, a like production server, so that your user or your customer can use it. That's when you have delivered a value, and that story would be completed. Uh, then, uh, you know, do you, once you've sliced and reached on the right sizing of the user story, develop each piece of uh, work, deliver in a product-ready environment and iterate and refactor. So another one, another one, another one. Um, now while doing this, you have to ensure that you do an active scope management. And how, how, how do we do that? So you have to do hard limiting of the duration of certain parts of the project, uh, time boxing. Uh, you must ensure that features are, uh, say for example, features could be around one month and user story should be around one month. So. Uh, because you're not, you haven't been doing, you won't be doing any estimations here. You won't be doing any any uh, 
planning based on those estimations. That's why you need to ensure that the sizes of those uh, pieces of work are more or, more or less similar. They may vary, but not very largely. Uh, rest low value user story. So uh, what happens is once you are breaking down a user story, you find that you broke down one into five, two are valuable, three are not. Those three don't make the cut and you know they get regrouped into a different user story or go back to backlog. The product backlog would keep growing. But, but the beauty of this, and in fact, AJL would be that you are uh, talking about embracing change. So uh, why I say so is that you know the next user story that you're going to deliver day after tomorrow could be the one that otherwise in a maybe waterfall or other project methodologies you may call as scope creeps. So there are no scope creeps really. We've converted scope creeps into embracing change principle here. Keep prioritizing the backlog. Uh, regularly to evolve to a more accurate prediction because you this is only required if in your project case you need to do some predictions or forecastings uh, for stakeholders or planning purposes it could be resource planning it could be timeline uh, planning it could be anything else uh, this entire system helps keeping system of development as stable and thus uh, you actually have to keep your system of development stable and uh, thus, you will be staying closer to the forecasted cost timeline target. Uh, another interesting way of, uh, so while you're doing this, you know, some companies and advocates uh, suggest using active scope management uh, via story, uh, story, user story mapping as well. This, is a, uh, this was uh, uh, popularized by Jeff Patton. Uh, it, it uh, r removes the flat user story backlog concept, you know, bag of contextual free mulch. Uh, this is basically a visual presentation of a product backlog. I will not go uh, in depth into this. Uh, you can read a lot about this approach on the internet. Uh, go to the website of Jeff Patton if you want. But this will allow you to visually look at your product backlog and while slicing, uh, push things into a current release plan or the next release plan or push them further down away and say that, okay, this is not required, stuff like that, and give you a visual uh, uh, aspect. This uh, fosters collaboration and build shared understanding because oftentimes, uh, you know, text written requirements may not give you the bigger picture. And this helps you identify gaps in backlog, see interdependencies, and helps in release planning activities. In case in your project, release planning is not required, the release aspect may be ignored, but I would still recommend using story uh, story maps. It's a very uh, good way of uh, managing product backlog and prioritizing. Uh, then comes forecasting. Now, you know, a lot of questions are to be answered, like, uh, you know, when can the client or the customer uh, expect X feature? When can he expect uh, something else? How much of resources or in investment do you need to do for a typical project? So. Uh, that's where forecasting comes in. Uh, we are in so instead of uh, doing uh, assumption, uh, estimations, we are focusing on forecasting here. Forecasting is based on empirical data past, based on uh, from, from your past experience, uh, calculating or predicting some future events, usually as a result of analysis of available pertinent data. Forecasting uses data while estimation does not. Estimation is purely guess or uh, uh, estimate as well, what we call it. Uh, so the questions that should be answered instead here uh, or asked are, you know, given the rate of progress so far and the amount of work still left, when will the project end or when will phase A or phase B end? Uh, given the rate of progress, how much of work can be finalized by, you know, X date or Y milestone or by Christmas? Uh, this is a, a chart that you can uh, map from your user story counts uh, and this explains the whole idea of how predictions and forecasting works and wh how the user story averaging would work here. So uh, uh, the, the red line up at the top is the target. Uh, the, in, in, in the bottom you have uh, the user stories and uh, on, the left, on the left hand side on the y axis is the time taken for completion of these user stories, sorry, the number of user uh, story points that you have achieved. And as you can see, once you are done through three or four sprints, and if your, your lines are within uh, 
the uh, the interval, the high interval and low interval, you, you, you'll have to define those intervals yourself looking at the data. So for example, sprint one, you delivered five user stories. Uh, sprint two, you delivered eight user stories. And uh, sprint three, you maybe delivered, uh, uh, say, two user stories. So you're looking at 15 user stories. So an average would become five. Uh, now, that two number is a little uh, uh, catchy here. So maybe instead of two, it's a little larger number. It's like these user stories are closer to each other. Story, story points, I mean, uh, story counts, I mean. Uh, then you can do an average. The, the red line you see in the bottom is the average line. And then you just need to ensure that all the user stories are you know, either above or below, but within the interval. The moment they seem to go beyond those intervals, something is wrong. You have, you're either not slicing your user stories properly, uh, or the, the system is not stable. So this will allow you to keep within those, uh, those boundaries. Thus, what you can do is, based on this throughput, you can, you, you can forecast, right? So if you're looking at an average of five user st uh, story, po story counts here per sprint, and the project requires around, uh, say, 500 story, coin, uh, story uh, stories, uh, story counts, you can say, OK, it should roughly take around 100 uh, such sprints. It could be 150, it could be, uh, sorry, it could be 130 maybe, it could be 80, but it definitely would not be 200, or you know, it definitely won't be 25 uh, sprints. And based on those uh, uh, sprint numbers, you can make some uh, budget planning, provide some sort of a date idea as to when can X number of features or the entire project be expected to complete. And uh, then as, as you go, you keep, uh, uh, reverting back to this chart on a sprint by sprint basis and keep tweaking the charts and y you'll see that you you have a stable system a end of the day uh, uh, you'll be able to achieve what you're looking for so uh, uh, three to five iterations average is suggested here uh, in terms of throughput because it's sufficient to predict future running running testable stories right and uh, if you remember the system stability rule that I uh, mentioned a few slides back. This is where you can see it in play. Uh, velocity outside limit three times in a row. So the, the, mm, the interval, the blue and the green line are the intervals. So it should be within those intervals. If it goes out, it's not a stable system. Likewise, if there are four same points in the same direction, the system is not stable. So you're not, uh, your system is not good enough at this point of time to make those intelligent forecasts based on your, your data. Uh, Another way of uh, providing uh, forecasting data to, to your client would be because you are focused on smaller user stories and the current sprint, really. Uh, you can create a window saying, you know, these F1, F2, F3. So these three features can be delivered in the period of, say, you know, current sprint. The remaining Y number of uh, features can be delivered for, you know, larger number of pe longer periods, say, say one, one year. And then remaining, these are these seems unlikely to be delivered within this project. So this will, this provides your client, your manager, your management, some actionable data, and based on these, they can make some decisions. Because remember, they have not asked for or received any estimations as such. So they need some they need some values to 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 plan things right. Um, so this is called rolling wave forecast. Uh, low overhead reporting it can be updated tweaked weekly uh, it's purely based on throughput measurement uh, it provides actionable information some common use cases uh, not exactly use cases but uh, uh, the way people are using it is uh, you know using no estimates plus kanban plus agile contracting uh, with capped tnm and incremental in delivery uh, plus some high level planning uh, idea is not to spend too much of time doing planning, not to spend too much, too much of time in estimating. Estimating a backlog is a waste. If estimations and predictions are absolutely required, then use impact mapping. And uh, you know, uh, I would like to uh, invite one of my friends here. Uh, I happen to sit with, uh, I happen to share uh, a seat in right next to him in a flight and learn that they're actually using all of this process and delivering some real great projects and complicated ones. So I thought maybe me talking about you know, projects that have been delivered by my organization or someone else's, why not someone else you know, validate that by saying, yes, this is working out for them. Uh, 
So before I hand over the mic to them, I know we have, uh, I, let me estimate, we have uh, around 18 minutes. Um, uh, well, one of the uh, approaches that they may talk about is behavior-driven development, which really works out for them. So uh, Rob, would you like to come, please, and talk about some of the projects? Thanks. Thank you. Do you need the slide or something? Uh, no, no. Okay. okay. Hi, um, everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Um, so I'm uh, Rob Knight, I'm a CTO at uh, Fluxus. Um, we're a, a consultancy based in, uh, in the UK and, uh, and in Asia. Um, we've actually been using uh, a no estimates based uh, system for the last two years. And you know, I think uh, I'd echo a lot of the, uh, the sentiments and the, the, uh, the kind of the data that, uh, that Piyush has uh, has kind of put forward in his slides. This is definitely the, the experience that we've had as well. Um, I think one of the questions that, that people often kind of ask us when we, when we talk about moving away from estimation is, is really, how do we know how long things are going to take? Uh, but if you actually think about that from the point of view of the person who's, who's leading a project, who's, who's funding a project, um, that's not normally the most meaningful way of seeing things. Um, people are thinking, we've got a certain amount of money to spend, um, and we want to see certain benefits for, for spending that money. So people are thinking about return on investment rather than thinking purely about how long is something going to take. Um, and what we find um, with our approach is that by, by time boxing um, and by thinking in terms of value, you start to drive the question towards, um, okay, we're going to spend this amount of money. Um, you know, that... Uh, what limits does that place on the, the level of complexity that we're able to kind of absorb in our project? So if we've got two days to do something, we really can't have a super complicated um, set of features in, the, in that time. We need to break that down into um, a series of features that, um, you know, that, that can be delivered within, the, within those constraints. And that actually drives a much more value-driven um, approach. People can think, well, for this amount of money, do I want to spend that amount of money to get this benefit? Um, and it, it, it's kind of much more um, easy present, uh, for clients to deal with uh, in those cases because they, uh, you know, that's, it's thinking in the language of the business and thinking in terms of the business rather than, you know, kind of six month, twelve month, kind of you know, uh, roadmaps of, of software delivery. Um, so what we've actually done is, is we've put together a whole process based around, around this approach, which we're, we're sharing with, uh, with other companies now. Um, we're sharing that with other Drupal agencies uh, and people outside of the Drupal space. Uh, and we've given this the name Focus, because we believe this is, this is really the, the thing that's most important um, in, in project delivery, is to actually focus on the outcomes that you want to get and, and not get lost in the the kind of the, the weeds of, of uh, you know, some of the details or, or some of the, you know, or, or committing to some kind of long-term plan and you then lose sight of, of, of your original objective. Um, and uh, the way that we do this is, is we begin by, by, you know, establishing what the goal for the, for the project is and we do that using a process uh, called impact mapping. We then work out from that to look at who's going to be affected by, um, by the project, so who, who needs to contribute towards achieving that goal. Obviously, in a, a Drupal context, content editors are going to be a big part of a lot of uh, CMS-driven uh, projects. Uh, obviously, customers and end users, which might be existing customers, it might be new customers, it might be different segments. Um, there might be a, a legal team, there might be an operations team, there might be a marketing team. All of these, these different stakeholders are involved. We think about what impacts we want to have on those people, and only once we have that do we then start to think in terms of what features we can deliver. And that that focus then um, is is really kind of driven on achieving an impact and not just on kind of ticking off items on a on a kind of delivery plan or on a roadmap. We then uh, take that through a, a lean UX process, so we we try to avoid doing you know, creating a large inventory of designs up front because that then is, is you know in, in much the same way as, as estimates can be wasteful, uh, doing designs can be wasteful in in, in the same way, um, and we then also go into to BDD, so behavior driven development, thinking about what does this thing actually need to do, you know what, what's the what's the uh, 
the kind of the interactions that people need to have that they couldn't have before? What does this? Uh, how does this create value through uh, through the behaviour of the system? Um, and what we find is that, that this works really, really well with Drupal. Um, Drupal kind of solves so many basic problems for you out of the box. You, know, you don't need to think about how are we going to do access control, how are we going to do user management, how are we going to do basic uh, content creation. So you can think very much in terms of business value. Uh, you're not kind of uh, putting a lot of technical uh, tasks into your backlog. You're putting business value uh, directly into the backlog. And then you're delivering that in, in, you know, in very small increments um, kind of, you know, really like two, three days at a time. Um, so in terms of the, the actual success that we've had with this, I think we've, we've, we've had some, some very successful engagements where people have kind of said to us that they'd never seen an approach like this used before. They're used to a traditional, uh, you know, waterfall process or they're used to a very rigid scrum process which had kind of become uh, kind of a little bit um, unmoored from some of the original values of the, the Agile uh, manifesto, certainly. Um, and we basically kind of, um, I think, well, I would say at this point, we've, we've got no regrets really from, from, from moving away from estimates. It's, it, I, I can't really think, at this point, I can't really think what I'd ever want an estimate for ever again, because kind of as, as, as has been pointed out, a lot of estimates are just wrong. They're just they're just you know plainly ludicrous, and I think people people start to lose lose confidence in a process when that kind of thing um, you know becomes apparent. So I know I've only got a uh, very short sp uh, space of time just to kind of validate some of some of these things. So I, I'd say if anybody wants to talk to me um, or any of us about the um, you know how we've implemented no estimates, I'd be more than happy to talk to anybody af afterwards and, and answer any questions. Um, for now, I'll, I'll hand you back to uh, Piers. Thanks, Rob. Um, no, no principles or, or practices or philosophies are, you know, you, you know, really valuable without validations. Um, I'll take you through two or three more slides just to touch upon what this movement was about and, you know, what it is, what's happening in no, hashtag no estimates uh, world. Uh, these are, uh, it's so basically, uh, hashtag no estimate is a, it's a hashtag for the topic of exploring alternatives uh, to estimations for making decisions in software development. Uh, it's been fairly active. The hashtag has been fairly active since 2011. Uh, you can actually go to Twitter and check out this hashtag. Uh, there have been lots of discussion both for and against this. So, you know, unless you have against happening, uh, it's not really a good uh, thing, I believe. Uh, and this has led to various blog articles, research papers, uh, interviews, podcasts, presentations, and conferences that I mentioned in the start. And learnings have inspired lots of teams, uh, like what Rob uh, mentioned, uh, and they've stopped doing estimations or minimal estimations, and you know made life and business more happy. Uh, these are some of the uh, uh, advocates and you know thinkers who have been involved in this hashtag conversations and this world: Woody Zool, Vasco Duarte, Neil Kellick, Chris Chapman, Henry Karatsu Dhawal Panchal. I have copied uh, some of their ideas and repurposed some of their uh, thoughts and slides into my presentation as well, which you saw. Uh, Ron Jeffries, Steve uh, Fenton, and many more. Uh, and these are some of their, you know, each of them have slightly modified version of how no estimates so should be worked upon. Uh, in the interest of time, I believe, you know, there are a few questions that need to be answered, so I'll skip through this, but you can go online, check out my slides later, and read more about their approaches. Uh, uh, Vasco Duarte has also written a book called No Estimations, No Estimates book. Uh, you can go online, buy that book. It's a very interesting book with a story of a, a, a lady project manager called Carmen and how she's, she manages these challenges and you know introduces herself to no estimations and delivered a fairly large, complicated, guaranteed, guaranteed failing project and converts it to a successful project. It's a very interesting uh, read. Uh, and in the end, uh, uh, before closing, uh, uh, a quote by Woody Zool that no estimates is merely a call to refocus on the Agile Manifesto. We, we all are aware of what Agile Manifesto are. Uh, and the takeaways from these sessions, 
don't stop doing what you're already doing, please. I'm not saying do not you know, stop doing your estimations. You don't want to uh, you know, create challenges with your boss and conflicts in your workplace. Don't stop doing that. Please continue doing that. Start exploring no estimates in your own way. Try taking out data from your last sprints, retrofitting them, see if the uh, uh, see if you are able to uh, trust those uh, throughputs or story uh, story counts more than story numbers. See if you were uh, able to time travel. Uh, if you would have used uh, uh, this approach instead of estimation, would you have actually reached at a better conclusion without estimations, which will lead you to actually move over from estimations to no estimates. Run small experiments, analyze measures. That's what I did as well. Try and get better at uh, creating simple and un uh, unambiguous slices of functionality. Measure your throughput. Compare story count data with your story point data. Uh, you know, question uh, that can you take better decisions with this? If yes, then that's the way to go. And discover for yourself if a no estimate approach is right for you. So there are multiple of these approaches out there. Uh, the one I was talking about, the one that I took you through, is uh, was uh, suggested by Vasco Duarte. Uh, Woody says, uh, do not do any predictions, no, nothing. I mean, just focus on value, deliver the right thing right now, and then the next one, and the next one, and that's it. And he's written loads of stuff about that. He's talked about one or two large project case studies as well. Uh, and questions? And uh, Rob, uh, you, you're welcome to answer the questions if uh, they are uh, for you. Yes, please. Uh, there's a mic here if you could uh, come to that. Yeah, I think I think you know uh, customer education is very important here. So this is a new thing. Customer needs to be educated. They need to be uh, convinced that uh, end of the day they are paying you to generate value. So you know, let's actually start it from the reverse and only work on, with value. Rob, what uh, what challenges or such you have faced in uh, trying to educate your clients? And you know, start saying no to clients if they don't believe that you know value is what is required and value is what you want to commit, not to a. Uh, a number that can be made up or you know a number that can just be there because uh, a client wants that a project manager wants that or it is to be done because that's how we have done it hmm. um, um, yeah so I, I think um, what we found was that um, that initial conversation with the client often isn't super detailed so the, the, that, that isn't at the level of individual acceptance criteria or, or requirements uh, for a story so it's it's okay to kind of talk you know, big picture about about you know we, we want to be in roughly this place in about three months that's that's kind of the conversation that you can have uh, what we found was that w uh, when we're actually working on on delivery and because we're working in an agile way we're not kind of creating a massive inventory of of requirements up front that we can use that time budget essentially to, to kind of drive the conversation when we're actually uh, firming up the requirements so we can say well you know, how much complexity, how much risk on, uh, are we willing to take at that point when we're defining the acceptance criteria? So as long as the, the, the kind of the, the executives or the sponsors or whoever is, is kind of funding the project is satisfied that they're going to get the value that they want after about, you know, after, the, after a certain time period, uh, the actual kind of conversations with, with product owners and, and, and people like that can be kind of driven much more in alignment with, with you know, well, this is, your, this is your budget, this is how long we've got, and these are our these are our value priorities. So we we haven't found that to be a particular problem. And is that with new clients as well, or with established ones? Was it easier? Or? Uh, it's been we've we've done that with both. Um, I think it's easier when there is trust. I think yep. that you, you can have suspicion sometimes that you know people want to know what, that they're getting value for money. They want to know uh, you know that you that you are genuinely kind of giving giving everything that you possibly can, but. Um, you know, we, we haven't found that to be particularly uh, in, in question, really. Yeah, uh, we've uh, we found this to be easier with existing clients. Uh, significantly, it's it's. Uh, I mean, the trust has been established, right? So, whatever you suggest, uh, they would uh, be fine in at least trying it out, as opposed to a new client who's yet to be yet to sign on the dotted lines, right? So, yeah, new clients. Uh, but the fun is, you know, convincing new clients about this approach. 
the fun is in convincing new clients. That's when you actually get good at it. Uh, this is a sales guy saying, I believe. <laughs> Any more questions, gentlemen? So, like your last quote kind of pointed out that this is a lot of the stuff is like the Agile Manifesto. Yes. So if you're in Scrum or Kanban, you're doing most of this stuff anyway. I was interested when you in the beginning you were saying stuff about getting, like, getting away from the gaming of story points and stuff like that. Like, how, can you talk a little bit more about that part? Like, how do you get to the point where when your team sucks at estimating and you know, providing hours or even t-shirting or whatever, so you don't have to do that. <laughs> like, how, how do you get to there? Uh, so how, how do you get to there? Well, um, just stop doing estimations. I mean, you know, uh, no, no more planning poker, right? Uh, you know, once you start uh, having a stable system and once you have uh, start building these uh, average story count throughputs, on projects, uh, you you don't need to do those estimations, right? I mean, you can just see the, the the beauty is you will say that a backlog has some large stories and smaller stories. How can you really make count them and say that we'll deliver them in X number of days? Well, that's the beauty of you know doing averaging here as well. Average really takes care of you know on on a larger project on larger timelines you can actually deliver those numbers of stories because remember you're also slicing them as you go uh, going forward. So. Uh, that's that's one of the ways you know once you have this process implemented you would not need to do any more estimations that's the whole idea right um it'll be hard to convince uh, uh initially right i mean that's what i also fig went through but uh, this has a huge value i can tell you you know all all of those estimation processes like a waste on the count, the story counts. yes focus on the story counts and ensuring that the sizes of those counts are appropriate uh, and uh, you know keep delivering the value uh, on a regular basis uh, a lot of times so th there's an example from my uh, one of the projects we're delivering we didn't follow this approach there it was a 12 month project we're actually releasing it on uh, end of this month and after six months the first six months the project uh, client comes back to say hey we need to cut down the monthly expenses because the markets have changed we've started uh, our website traffic has gone down by 50 percent this particular industry is not uh, using this product as they used to what about those, uh, you know, 80% of features that we've already delivered uh, in the last six months? It's a waste. That's fine. So had this been uh, an approach from the get-go, they would have only delivered those 20, 30, 40% of user stories or features, you know. With time, you realize that, okay, this was really not important, right? So I hope I tried to answer your question. Yeah, thanks. Special considerations if you are preparing a proposal in which it's a competitive bidding situation, say an RFP. This might not work for RFPs and uh, certain cases. So this, I mean, uh, yeah, I believe so. Does this work for RFPs and those I things I where a fixed say. estimate is required? I would say go ahead, you know, based on your guesstimates, do those estimations, get the project, throw away the estimates and, you know, work on this approach going <laughs> forward. Because you got the project, estimations are done. Now deliver value. Yep. <laughs> have, have you been in a situation where you have, as you said before, tried to convince a new client? So if you know you're in a competitive bidding situation, actually addressing this model in your proposal? Oh, yeah. I mean, you have to express this in multiple ways, right. you know. I just wonder if anyone's had success with that. Uh, so in your uh, cases, have you, have you done that? Um, Rob? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I think um, kind of echoing the, the, the question that we had um, earlier, I think that that initial process, um, I think it depends partly on who you're talking to, but I think if you're talking to someone who is sufficiently um, you know, senior, who is involved in commissioning the work, what they care about is, are you going to deliver on my objectives? Not necessarily are you going to deliver according to what a project manager might might think, you know, somebody who has a particular approach that they might favor. If that's not going to deliver value as well as, as, as our approach is going to deliver value, then our approach is going to win. Um, and so that's what we sell on, really, is we sell on, you know, this, this works for our clients, people are happy with, uh, with the results, and it's the best way of getting your objectives um, to be realized. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, Rob, for uh, you know, helping. <laughs>